Essentially, what I want to do tonight is to kind of talk about where we are as a nation, how we got to where we are, and then where I think we should be going. And the first point that I want to make is, and I think everybody in the room understands this, that uh, the history of America and the fight for human dignity is a history of struggle. Frederick Douglass said it right, freedom is never given to you, it has to be fought for. When we think about workers' rights, we understand there was a time in this country's history, and certainly our right-wing friends want to bring us back to that time, when workers had virtually no rights at all. When people who needed to feed their families were 100% dependent on their employers, if the employer didn't like their color or where they came from, if the employer was not happy if they didn't work on Saturday or Sunday, that worker was fired. That worker had no rights whatsoever. And people struggled. They struggled because they said, I am a human being. I have rights. You can't do that to me. I need dignity. And unions were formed, and people fought, and people died, and people were beaten, and people went to jail. And the goal of that effort was for people to sit down and collectively negotiate contracts with workers, get decent wages and decent benefits. That struggle took decades. When we talk about civil rights, we take it for granted, especially the young people in the room, and I'm delighted to see so many young people here, that we have an African-American president of the United States. You know how that happened? That happened for a hundred years. People fought against racism. They fought. I was just in Selma, Alabama a couple of weeks ago to honor the 50th anniversary of the march over the Pettus Bridge there. And I went to the museum. And you read about Birmingham, Alabama in a 20-year period. There were 50 bombings, 5-0 bombings of people involved in the civil rights movement, culminating in the death, of course, of those beautiful children. There was terrorism in Birmingham. But people didn't give up. They went to jail, they struggled. In terms of women's rights, 30 years ago, there were two women in the United States Senate. Today, there are 21 women. Today, there are women governors. When I was mayor of the city of Burlington, it was a very big deal because we appointed the first woman to be a police officer in the city of Burlington, Vermont. Today, there are women generals there are women in the military. There are women, when I was growing up, very few women went to medical school. Very few women went to law school. There has been a radical transformation. How did that happen? Think it happened by accident? It happened because people struggled. A hundred years ago, women didn't even have the right to vote. Change takes place because people struggle. You talk about... Not so many years ago, when a family would have a child with a disability, do you know what happened? As often as not, the family kept it a secret. That child was institutionalized. There was a bit of a shame having a child with a disability. Today, all over America, kids with disabilities are in our public schools. They are loved by their classmates. We're proud of them. They are part of us. They are part of humanity. That happened because people struggled. And last, one can give many examples, but maybe the last one that I want to give you in terms of struggle and in terms of change is the fight regarding gay rights. If people were sitting in this room, not decades ago, but 10 years ago, and if Somebody jumped up and said, you know, I think in some of the conservative states in America, they're going to be supporting gay marriage. People in the room would have said, you are crazy. <laughs> and yet, again, because of the struggle of people in the gay community and their allies, we have radically transformed that culture in America. I go out to high schools all over the state of Vermont. I go to the conservative parts of the state, and I ask the kids, I said, raise your hand. Tell me what you think 
about gay marriage. And kids kind of shrug their shoulders and they say, what are you talking about? What is the big deal? Which is exactly what we've always wanted in the first place. What is the big deal? All right. The point is that when millions of people stand up and fight, they win. That's it. And when people do not stand up and fight, we lose. Now, what is going on in this country is a moment which is kind of historical. It is an extraordinary moment because the problems that we face as a nation are probably more serious than at any time since the Great Depression of the 1930s. That's the truth. And if you throw in the planetary crisis of climate change, it is possible they are more serious. The first major point that I want to make is that the problems we faced did not come down from the heavens. They are made, they are made by bad human decisions. And good human decisions can change them. Despair, one of the things, one of the problems that we have got to deal with right now, and I think Jim was referring to this, is all over this country, you got a lot of bright, decent, good people, and they're saying, you know what? Situation is hopeless. You can't beat the Koch brothers, you can't beat the billionaires, you can't win, I'm giving up. That is exactly what they want us to believe. And I beg of you, do not enter that world of despair. We can win this fight if we stand together. In order to win this struggle, we are going to need nothing less than a political revolution. And let me tell you what I mean by a political revolution. When, as was the case in this last election in November, when 63% of the American people chose not to vote, when 80% of young people, when 75% of low-income workers chose not to vote, what we need to do is create a momentum so that 70, 80, 90 percent of the people vote, and when that happens, we win hands down. We need real campaign finance reform. Because at the end of the day, whether you're concerned about jobs or wages, or health care, or education, or climate change, we are not going to go where we have to go so long as a handful of billionaires are capable of purchasing the United States government. <laughs> to my mind, Citizens United will go down in history as one of the very worst, most disgraceful decisions ever made by a U.S. Supreme Court. We have got to, through a constitutional amendment, overturn Citizens United. We need a Disclosure Act immediately, which will be some help. It will mean that when Charles and David Koch put their ugly 30-second ads on television, their pretty faces are going to have to be there telling the American people they approve of those ads. Yeah. And in my view, given the incredible wealth and income inequality in America today, we need fair elections, which means public funding of elections. Yeah. Now, ultimately, what a political revolution means is nothing more or less than ordinary Americans understanding the importance of politics and government in their lives. Now, I know and you know. You go home, you talk to your friends, and you say, you tell them, but, you know, I heard Bernie Sanders, the senator from Vermont, and they say, well, where is Vermont, and <laughs> what is the United States Senate? And politics is all bullshit. I wouldn't get involved. Why did you waste your time coming out to this meeting? 
you know, I got to work my third job and I can't afford to send my kids to college and I don't have enough money to feed my family. Well, why are you involved in politics and wasting your time? And what you have to explain to them is that the Koch brothers, the second wealthiest family in America, are going to spend $900 million in the coming election cycle. They think politics is important. If they think politics is important, every working person in this country should damn well know that politics is important. About a year ago or so, there was a poll. Pollsters do these things, and they asked the American people, they said, can you tell me a year ago, which political party controls the U.S. House and which party controls the U.S. Senate? That was then, and Democrats controlled the Senate, Republicans controlled the House. 63% of the American people could not name which parties control the U.S. House and the Senate. We are not going to bring about the change that we need unless people, A, understand the importance of politics, B, know what their elected officials are doing and are not doing, and C, hold them accountable. And if, and if people don't know that, if people don't know that, Republicans could pass a budget as they did last week, and I speak as the ranking member of the Budget Committee, a budget which threw 27 million Americans off of health insurance, cut Pell Grants by $90 billion over a 10-year period, making it harder for kids to go to college, and then gave huge tax breaks to the wealthiest people in America. But if people are not involved in thinking politically, and if we don't have a media which reports this information, people are not going to know what's going on, and that's got to change. Now what I want to do, what I want to do is to tell you what relatively few public officials will tell you, and that is what the hell is going on in the United States of America. And that is that for a 40-year period, not six years, not 12 years, a 40-year period, what we have been witnessing is the disappearance of the American middle class. That is the reality. Now, I want you all to think about this. Everybody here knows that we have seen in recent years an explosion in technology, right? We have seen huge increases in worker productivity. Every worker in this room is producing more. Logically, in a rational economy, if I gave you a tool that increased your productivity by 50%, what should you expect? you should expect a significant increase in your income because you're producing more, or maybe you would be able to work significantly fewer hours. That's what you have a right to expect. But what in fact is going on now, despite the explosion of technology and the increase in productivity, workers are working longer hours and they're earning lower wages. That is absurd. That has got to change. Now, the newspapers tell you that nationally, unemployment is at about 5.5%. That's official unemployment. Well, there is another government statistic out there. And that says if you look at all of those people who have given up looking for work, of which there are many, or even more importantly, people who are working part-time when they want to work full-time. Know anybody who's working part-time when they want to work full-time? If you add all that together, do you know what unemployment is in America? It is 11%. When you talk about unemployment, you know what we never talk about? Is youth unemployment. Never talk about it. That is 17%. We never talk about African-American youth unemployment which is off the charts. Bottom line is we need to create millions of decent paying jobs in this country. And I'll talk in a moment about how I think we can do that. When we talk about what's going on in the economy, here's another issue that we never talk about. It is called poverty. 
We have over 40 million people in this country who are living in poverty, and the reason it's so high is the people have fallen from the middle class. These are people who are struggling to put food on the table, struggling to make sure they have gas money to put in the car so they can get to work, struggling to be able to pay for childcare for their kids. When we talk about what's going on in our economy today, we should understand that 35 million Americans still, despite the modest gains of the Affordable Care Act, 35 million Americans still have no health insurance and many more, including people in this room, are underinsured with high deductibles and high co-payments. In my view, it is time that the United States of America join the rest of the industrialized world and guaranteed health care to all people as a right, not a privilege. And when you talk about health care, it's important that everybody understand this. You've got 35 million people with no health insurance. You've got many more who are underinsured. And at the end of the day, guess what? We end up spending almost twice as much per person on health care as do the people of any other country. It is time, in my view, to move to cost-effective universal health care, which means a Medicare for all single payer program. When we talk about the economy, understand that since 1999, the median middle class family, that family right in the middle of the American economy, has seen its income go down by almost $5,000 after adjusting for inflation. Incredibly, that family earned $500 less last year than it did 26 years ago. You want to know why people are angry? You want to know why people are frustrated? They're working longer and longer hours. They're working harder, and they are making less. Typical, the median male worker, that guy right in the middle of the American economy in inflation-adjusted dollars, made $783 less last year than he did 42 years ago. And that median woman worker earned $1,300 less last year than she did in 2007. And that means that the working class of this country is on the move. Problem is, we're moving in the wrong direction. And here's something, again, not talked about, something that should make us all very, very nervous. Half of all Americans have less than $10,000 in their savings account. Now, do you know what that means? And do you know why people are so stressed out? If you have less than $10,000, that means an automobile accident, a divorce, a serious illness, a crisis of one kind or another can drive you into bankruptcy and financial disaster. So what you have, and you can see it in people's faces all over America, they are scared to death. If you're 55 years of age, you're worried that some 25-year-old kid is going to take your job. If you are a young person who graduated college, you're wondering if you're going to be driving a cab for your whole life. I will relate to you a story that occurred a few years ago, I, I, and I'll never forget this. I met a woman outside of a grocery store in my hometown of Burlington, Vermont. This is what she said. She said, you know, Bernie, I'm working three jobs. My husband is working three jobs. We're working at different hours. We have one kid. We would like to have more kids. But we cannot be the kind of parents we want to be. That's going on all over America. To the young people, let me shock you with a statistic here. There was once a time, and the older folks in this room will remember it, radical, crazy idea, where one worker in a family, in those days usually the man, one worker was able to earn enough money to take care of the entire family. Today, 
all over America. You got mom working, you got dad working, occasionally you have the kids working, and we still don't have enough money to pay the bills. Something is fundamentally wrong about that. Now, when we talk about the decline of the middle class, there are a lot of reasons why one can go on for hours and hours, and I'm only gonna go on for three hours, so I gotta, <laughs> gotta make it a little bit short here. Please understand that since 2001, our nation has lost over 60,000 factories. For the young people, let me shock you again and tell you, there was once a time when you walked into a store you could actually buy products made in the United States of America. All right? As a, it's true. I know it's hard to believe. It's true. As a result of disastrous trade agreements, which I should tell you I have consistently voted against. Yeah. Trade agreements like NAFTA, CAFTA, and permanent normal trade relations with China, which essentially said to American workers, okay, you're going to now have to compete against people in China who make a buck or two bucks an hour. That's your competition. And we are going to shut down the factory and move there because we can make more money. But if we stay here, by the way, you better take a cut in your health care benefits, take a cut in your wages. And the result of all of that has been a race to the bottom. I'll tell you not a funny story. A couple of years ago, there was a piece in the paper. And it pointed out that in Lexington, Kentucky, General Electric was, in fact, expanding manufacturing jobs, a couple of hundred new jobs. That was good news. And they asked the guy from GE, they said, well, how does that happen? Why are you doing this? You know, you've been to China or all over the world. Why are you bringing jobs back to Louisville? And he said, well, you know what? America is now becoming competitive with the rest of the world community. In other words, wages and benefits have gone down so much that we are now competitive with China. Our job is not to be competitive with China. Our job is to see China's wages go up, not our wages go down. Which, by the way, is why every person in this room, in my view, should organize and do everything you can to defeat the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's It is the same old, same old, except it may even be worse. All right, let me talk a moment about something that I know everybody in this room, especially the young people, are concerned about, and that's education. I think everybody here knows that to be educated, intellectual pursuit, is part of what makes us human. But in addition to that, we are in a highly competitive global economy, and common sense suggests that we have got to have the best educated workforce in the entire world. 30 years ago in the United States, 30 years ago, the United States led the world in terms of the percentage of our people who graduated college. Today, we are in 12th place. Today, all over this country, in every state in the union, you have young people who are saying, you know what? Yeah, I'm smart. Yeah, I really would like to go to college but I don't want to leave school $60,000, $70,000 in debt in an unstable economy. I'm not going. So think of what that means to our country in that we're wasting the intellectual capital of so many bright young people. And then on top of that, you have millions of people who have graduated college and are now deeply in debt. I talked to a woman in Burlington, Vermont, I don't know, six months ago. Her crime was that she went to medical school and is now practicing medicine with low-income people, primary health care. Exactly what we need because we have a crisis in terms of the need of primary health care physicians. She's doing exactly what our country needs. She graduated medical school, $300,000 in debt. All right. So what we are doing, in a sense, is saying to the young people of this country, that we're going to do everything we can to make it as hard as possible for you to get an education. That is crazy. Within the next month, I will introduce legislation that will make every public college, 
and public university tuition free. And people say, is that expensive? And the answer is, yeah, it is expensive, but it is more expensive not to do that. And maybe at a time when my Republican friends just decided to put another $38 billion into the military, maybe we can cut military spending a little bit and put it into education. I've described just a little bit, and you know the story better than I do, because many of you are living that story. The story of wondering what's going to happen economically to your family next year, what's happening to your parents, what's happening to your kids. That is the story of the American middle class today. It's going down and down and down. But there is another reality. What is strange about this moment in history, it's not like some tornado hit all of us and all of us are hurting. What is happening is that while the middle class is disappearing, while we have almost as many people living in poverty today as any time in the modern history of this country, there is another phenomenon going on. And that is the wealthiest people and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well. That's the reality. Today, and I'm going to tell you what you know, very few elected officials will tell you, but here it is. Today, the United States has by far the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any major country on earth, and it is worse in our country today than at any time since the late 1920s. And I'm going to bore you for a moment, if I might, with some facts that are important, I think, for you to hear. And by the way, you can get all this information from my website, uh, sanders.senate.gov. Today, 1%, the richest 1%, owns almost 42% of the wealth of America. The bottom 60% owns less than 2%. Today, in fact, the top one-tenth of 1%, I'm not talking about 1%, I'm talking about the top one-tenth of 1% owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90% of the American people. Today, one family, the Walton family of Walmart, and they're worth about $150 billion. That one family, one family, is worth more than the bottom 40% of the American people, 130 million Americans. And they collect wealth. That's right, they damn well do. They do because they pay their workers so low wages that their workers have to go onto Medicaid, onto food stamps, into government-sponsored housing. That's right, they are the largest recipient of welfare in America. Over the past 40 years, you know, my Republican friends are very, very worried. They're very worried about redistributing wealth. Oh my God, terrible. But the answer is, and the truth is, we have seen a massive redistribution of wealth in this country over the last 40 years. The only problem is the wealth has gone from the working people and the middle class to the top one-tenth of one percent. Now, when you watch, you're here on TV, you're reading the papers, the Republicans are talking about throwing millions of people off health care, cutting nutrition, cutting education, and that's just because, you know, we're just a very, very poor country, and we can't afford to do all these things. But you all know that we are the richest country in the history of the world, and we have never been richer than we are today. The problem is that the top 1% has almost all of the wealth. That's the problem. Now, I want you to listen to one more statistic, because I just learned this two weeks ago, and it blew me away. In the last two years, from 2013 to 2015, the wealthiest 14 people, not 1,400, not 14,000, the wealthiest 14 people in this country, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, the Koch brothers, those type of guys, 
their wealth in that two-year period went up by $157 billion in a two-year period. Their wealth increased by $157 billion. That is more wealth than the bottom 42% of the American people own, what these guys have received in the last two years. And I can tell you that my Republican colleagues in the Senate and in the House are adamant that these guys will not pay a nickel more in taxes. And we're going to deal with that. Now, in terms of income, we talked about wealth, which is what we accumulate over our lifetimes. In terms of income, which is what we made last year, in terms of income, the last information that we have, and this is just unbelievable stuff, it's hard to believe that this is America, is that since the crash of Wall Street brought about by the greed and recklessness and illegal behavior of the people on Wall Street, since that time, 99% of all new income is going to the top 1%. All right. So what that means is, you know, you read in the papers and say, well, our GDP growth was 2.5%. It was 3%. It was 4%. It doesn't matter for the middle class because they're not getting any of it. You're going to have GDP growth of 10%. It wouldn't matter much when 99% of all new income is going to the top 1%. Last year, the top 25 hedge fund managers on Wall Street made more income than 425,000 public school teachers. And all over America, in Vermont and I suspect in Texas, we're firing teachers, we're doing away with art. We just don't have the money to provide a good education to our kids, and yet 25 hedge fund managers made more money than 425,000 public school teachers. Today, corporate profits are at an all-time high, and CEOs earn about 270 times what their average employee earns. In terms of taxes, what you should know is that every single year, we lose about $100 billion in taxes because corporate America stashes their profits in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda other tax havens, refuses to pay taxes. One out of four major corporations pays nothing in taxes. In a given year, companies like Verizon, General Electric, Boeing pay zero in federal income taxes. Warren Buffett was honest enough to say that in terms of personal income tax, he's a multi-billionaire, his effective tax rate was lower than his secretary's. And that's true. All right, those are the problems. We're looking at a vulgar, obscene, grotesque maldistribution of wealth and income. How do we rebuild America? Well, let me give you some ideas. Number one, the first and most important issue, in my view, is the need to create millions of decent paying jobs. What is the best and fastest way to do it? In Vermont and throughout this country, our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our water systems are crumbling. I have introduced legislation that would put a trillion dollars over a five-year period into rebuilding our infrastructure that would create and maintain 13 million decent paying jobs. At the end of the day, we don't rebuild the middle class of this country if we don't rebuild the trade union movement. And we have got to make it And we have got to make it easier and not harder for workers to be able to join unions. When we talk about the economy, it's not just jobs, it is wages. The minimum, federal minimum wage of seven and a quarter an hour is a starvation wage. We've got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage and over a period of years to at least $15 an hour. We need pay equity for women workers. They should not be making 78 cents on the dollar. There is an issue, you know, it is hard, when we talk about the important issues facing our country, it is hard to decide which is more important. Is healthcare more important than education? Is education more important than a job? You know, those are impossible discussions. But here is an issue 
that for the future of this planet, we just cannot ignore. And that is the absolute need to cut carbon and transform our energy system and reverse climate change. It is an international embarrassment that the vast majority of Republicans in the Senate and the House deny what the scientific community is telling us. Climate change is real. It is caused by human activity. It is already causing devastating problems. And if we don't get our act together, it will get worse. We need to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency, to sustainable energies like wind, solar, geothermal. And when we do that, we're going to create a whole lot of jobs as well. My Republican colleagues, who, by the way, went to war in Iraq, went to war in Afghanistan, and forgot to pay for those wars, which will end up costing us between four and six trillion dollars, they have now decided that they want to balance the budget on the backs of the elderly and the children and the most vulnerable people in this country. They want to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. My view, and we've introduced legislation to do this, is that not only are we going to stop them cutting Social Security, we are going to expand Social Security benefits. Let me conclude by telling you what we are up against, so you really know what the nature of the opposition is. In 1980, 1980, David Koch ran for vice president of the United States on the Libertarian Party. And he helped fund that campaign. And that campaign had a set of principles. They had a platform. To the best of my knowledge, nothing that was in that platform 35 years ago has changed. And I you know, work with people who know something about this. I want you to understand, this is important, the vision of the family that is now the most powerful political force in America. They will spend more money in this next election cycle than the Republican Party will or the Democratic Party will. They already have a political database which is stronger than the Republican Party's database, and they're only going to get stronger. So it's one thing to say, well, isn't it awful that they're going to spend $900 million or more? And that's true. But I want you to know what, in fact, they believe. They believe, and this is what most Republicans now believe, that Citizens United did not go far enough. Citizens United allows billionaires to spend as much as they want on independent expenditures. They come up with phony organizations, Citizens for a Better This or That, and you put ugly ads on that, they can do it. That's huge. They want to go further. They want to eliminate all campaign finance law. And by the way, the leadership of the Republican Party now holds that view. And let me tell you what it means. It means that the Koch brothers and other billionaires will sit in front of a room like this, where hundreds and hundreds of people will be there. And they'll say, okay, you want to run for the U.S. Senate from Colorado? We've got a check for $200 million for you. And that doesn't matter to us because we're worth $85 billion. And she is going to be your speechwriter. He will be your media consultant. And he will be your campaign manager. Young man, while you run, you understand you work for us. You are part of my employment. I own you. Got it all? That is where they are moving toward, where you ca they can give direct contributions to candidates and own the United States Congress and governor's offices all over America. That's what they said 35 years ago, and that's what's happening now. What they also have said is, we quote, we favor the abolition of Medicare and Medicaid programs. Not cutting them. They favor the abolition. I want you to think of an America where you're poor and you and your kids are on Medicaid. That's gone. What happens to you when you get sick? What happens to you when you have an accident? Where do you turn to? 
You are desperate. They are taking us back a hundred years in American society. Quote, we favor the repeal of the fraudulent, virtually bankrupt, and increasingly oppressive social security system. Gone. Not cut. Gone completely. Before social security was implemented, half of the elderly people in this country lived in poverty. Today, the number is too high. It's about 10%. They want to get rid of social security. Quotes. We oppose all personal and corporate income taxation. <laughs> Nothing serious. They just want to abolish the government. Other than that, it's not a significant proposal. And by the way, this is how crazy it is. And, and the point that I'm making here is that these ideas 35 years ago were thought to be crazy. Today, in many respects, they are mainstream Republican ideas. A guy from the Business Roundtable, you know what the Business Roundtable is? It is a group of the CEOs of the largest corporations of America. He came before my committee and he said, yeah, that's true. I questioned them. Yeah, I believe we should abolish all corporate taxes. Quote, quote, we, we support repeal of all law which impede the ability of any person to find employment, such as minimum wage laws. What does that mean? We're struggling to make the minimum wage a living wage. Their view is get rid of the minimum wage, and in high unemployment areas, if I can hire you for three bucks an hour, hey, that's what freedom is about. Okay? We advocate the complete separation of education and state. You know what that means? The end of public education in America. And by the way, in all of these areas, they are making significant progress. We support the abolition of the Environmental Protection Agency. In other words, companies and factories could produce all the garbage and crap they want, dump it into our lakes, our streams, into the air, poison our kids. That's freedom. Because you don't want the government limiting what these companies can do. Last point. Quote, we oppose all government welfare, relief projects, and aid to the poor programs. All these government programs are privacy invading, paternalistic, demeaning, and inefficient. What does that mean? In English, it means the end of every program that working people have fought for for the last 80 years. Food stamps, gone. Medicare, gone. Medicaid, gone. Head Start, gone. Worker safety, gone. All of those programs and more are gone. And they will return us toward a type of feudalism where a few people have incredible wealth, a few people control the political process through their campaign contributions. And if you're old and you're sick, maybe, just maybe, somebody will throw you a few bucks so you can go to the doctor. But you have no rights. You don't have the right to get Medicare or Medicaid. You don't have the right of a minimum wage. It's all gone. And their idea of the new society that they want to move us toward is a feudalistic society where the people on top control it all. I began my remarks by suggesting to you that I think in a number of areas we have made real progress in America in making our country a less discriminatory country. Whether it is civil rights, whether it is women rights, whether it's disability rights, whether it is gay rights, we have made some real, really good progress. But the one area we have not only not made progress, but where we have seen a real deterioration is in terms of the economic rights of working families. And what I can tell you this, and I'm there in Washington and I see it every day, these people, Koch brothers and others, you would think that a family that has $85 billion might be content. <laughs> might think maybe they had enough to just get by, pay the bills. But they are not content. They want more and more, and they're prepared to step on anybody and everybody to get what they want. So how do, they, how do we deal with this? Well, I'll tell you, there is no magical formula, but it is the same type of struggle that we have waged for so many years, and that is we have to educate and we have to organize. What we need to do is bring millions of people into the political process. We need for people in Congress, Republicans, and, as Jim Hightower reminded us, Democrats, to know that people are watching them. 
that if they're not going to vote for jobs, they're going to lose their job. And if they're not going to vote for health care, they're going to lose their health care. So that's where we are at. And, and let me just say this. I am in this business because I have four beautiful kids and I have seven beautiful grandchildren. And like you, I want to make sure that the world that we leave them is a beautiful world where people can live full and dignified lives. I don't want to see a world where people are struggling and stepping all over each other. And we can do it. We can provide health care to all of our people. We can create decent paying jobs. We can reverse climate change and transform our energy system. We can raise wages. We can make sure that every person in this country gets the education they need and desire. This is not some type of utopian dream. It can happen. It really can. But it will not happen unless we stand up and fight back for not only ourselves, but for our kids and future generations. Let's do it. Thank you all very much. You're great. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good.